all voted on the meeting. All right, let's uh, have a quick little discussion about what is going to happen today. If we can look up here, we have three things. We need to finish talking about lifeboat, lifeboat ethics and Northern questions. We need to look at the topics at the end of the story. There's like three of them. So we need to pick one and do a quick little response for that. And then we are going to do uh, one other little uh, activity. So we've got some stuff to do over this story. I want to share with you um, an article that I came across yesterday about um, teaching mindfulness to students who are uh, approaching some obstacle, whether it's your SAT or ACT or maybe your AP test. And what they said is more and more schools are seeing the value of um, teaching students how to come in at the beginning of class and to uh, center themselves balance themselves in a way so that they can uh, optimize <coughs> the instruction that's provided and try to absorb as much of that as possible, make cogent responses, uh, think critically, think uh, independently, think analytically, and be able to, you know, use all parts of their brain. Why don't you go get a drink? So, in in the process of reading uh, this article, it said that some schools are trying things like yoga, meditation. Uh, if it's a parochial school, they frame each class period with prayer at the beginning and at the end of class. Uh, and they try to find other activities throughout the day to help bring students to the present moment so that they can um, learn in the best way possible. So I think that's the theory behind why teachers teach bell to bell. That's how I've always been trained and that's always been the expectation anywhere I ever was that you have instruction bell to bell. You do not waste two or three minutes at the beginning of period. Uh, you don't waste five minutes at the end. That adds up to, you know, 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes for the week of lost time when you multiply those times at the beginning and the end where you're trying to get situated. So they said to think about this when you come in the class. You know, the transition time, the passing period, really is not enough time to shift gears and go into that other direction off track to start being social and striking up those conversations because you really barely have enough time to run to the restroom, grab a snack or a drink or whatever and then get to your next class, get your materials out and be ready to go. So you really kind of have to keep that flow of things. They talk about flow was another um, term that they used in the article and they said how do you achieve a, a state where you flow, because I hadn't really heard that vocabulary in this context before, and they said that's that place where you get, um, where your mind is so much on the task at hand that there are no distractions. You, you aren't looking at the clock, you aren't looking at your phone, you're not looking at, you know, whatever. You are so focused on the task at hand and so absorbed in it that you lose everything else that's around you and you suddenly have a bubble where you can focus on nothing else but the thing that you're doing. And so I think it's important, uh, if, you, if you think I'm um, impatient about getting started, it's as it should be. You know, when you come in and stand around talking with each other, that's the opposite of what a person who's trying to get in the zone should be doing with themselves. You need to be getting your stuff out and asking yourself mentally, what did we do yesterday? What is it that we're, ha what's happening now? What, am I, what are we getting ready to do? I should kind of know this. She probably told us yesterday. Uh, what materials do I need? Should I be looking back over that briefly? And that really is how that needs to happen. As you get older, for example, in higher ed, that is the expectation. Unspoken, it's kind of like peer pressure at that point. If you walk in and stand around and you're talking loudly or laughing or whatever, socializing, 
everybody's going to be mean minded you, like, what is your problem? You know, we're in the classroom, so don't shut up. You know, get with what we're doing because they do. They come in there, and if there is any talking, it's almost a whisper. It's very quiet, and then when, it, you know, like when it's time to start, they start immediately. So I think that's kind of what we need to kind of work toward. Not so much, I'm not really focusing on the beginning and end, sometimes being bumpy. But I'm talking about through the whole class. You're trying to achieve that thing where it's time to go. And you're saying, wow, it doesn't seem like we've been here for 35 or 40 minutes because you're so into whatever we're doing. You can't get to that place if you are multitasking and you're looking at your tablet screen or you're glancing down at your phone or you're trying to knock out a couple of math problems on the DL. You know, it's not going to happen for you. You can't do that and fully get everything that you need to get and uh, to grow your brain in here. So, I wanted to share that little article that I found. My new word, flow, that's not, you know, I've always known what that was to get in the zone. I think that's what I called it. But they called it um, that place where you, I don't know if that's a new word or if I just somehow missed it. <laughs> But um, that was interesting to hear them talk about it that way. So back to lifeboat ethics. If you were to Google this, maybe a couple of you did, you would see that there's a couple of random videos online. There's a web, there's a Wikipedia page on lifeboat ethics and on Garrett Hardin, the author of this piece. And um, there's numerous different essays that have been written that you can uh, access online and read in response to some of the things that this person says in his um, essay here. And uh, some of them agree, disagree, some of them are analytical, kind of like AP uh, responses. But that's about it. This guy is an economist, so he has his own following uh, of people who share the same world perspective and world view as he does. And really, you know, isn't that what we all do? We try to find um, compatible common thinkers who agree with us, who validate us and say, you know, hey, that makes sense. That's right. I think you're right. I'm going to be in this camp over here with you. So we're thinking these thoughts and these other people are thinking these other thoughts over there. And so he has his group of followers who embrace his ideas about helping the poor, among other things. Uh, they understand kind of where he's coming from, that they don't see humanity as one connected holistic organism where we should be compelled to help one another. And kind of like in that first one about the train and the kid that was going to get hit by the train, that article was to compel you to give, what was it, $200? or more if you can afford it, of just expendable cash that you don't have earmarked for rent or your own car payment or something, but to give any extra money you have instead of going to the mall, give it to make a, a discernible difference in a child's life that is starving or that is living in a disease, um, disease area where there's high risk that they're going to uh, be sick or some other war-torn situation where they need shelter. Maybe they're refugees. You know, if you watch the news, you're hearing all these about all these refugees coming to different countries. So you can find uh, whatever uh, vehicle you want to use to do your good deed, to participate in your charity, to make a difference. There's so many out there, and there's so much need but this article is the flip version of the first one, saying, you know, that there's no way to do this. It is a hopeless thing. And he gives a lot of statistical numbers. As far as appeals go, I think the first guy relied, if you had to pick which appeal he used primarily, what was it? Pathos. Pathos. And in this article, what does he do? Logos. I think he does. He appeals to reputable organizations. He quotes statistics and facts to show us that it's impractical to think that we're going to make a discernible difference. It's impractical to think that there's a way to feed everyone. And he does a fairly decent job, I guess, of proving his point that if it's not possible 
to take care of everyone, we have to accept the, um, the consequence of that is that there will be people who will die. There will be people who do not survive. And in a way, that's kind of a culling. You hear, have heard that word used recently, like a culling of the population. It needs to shrink. It needs to be reduced. There needs to be some way where there's less people, so there's enough for the ones that are here. How do you make that happen? You know, that's that's the plot of uh, you know movies about villains who have schemes to reduce the population by doing this, that, or the other. Um, there's a lot of uh, movie scripts that are, are centering around that that idea, but whatever by through whatever means it happens, uh, in this piece he's reinforcing that time and again how it's impractical, it's unrealistic, it is not feasible to save everyone and those who do have barely enough, who are in the lifeboat as the United States is metaphorically. Uh, characterized as being, he says, we have, it's like the Titanic where they didn't go up close and let all the drowning people tip the boat over or too many of them get on and sink it. You have to kind of keep your distance in a safe way that's reasonable, do what you can, but at a certain point you have to just sit comfortably in that boat and realize there's not enough for everyone. And that is a tragic thing, but it is reality and that that's the way it has to be. If some people will survive, they have to guard and protect what they have. So that's an interesting philosophy. Um, I want to just look at one piece of this before we uh, go on. I'm hoping that you read this carefully, uh, like you were supposed to, because there's things, for example, at the end about the Chinese fish and miracle rice, and. Uh, the effect of the, on the environment. Immigration is a big part of this. That's a hot issue, hot topic these days, immigration. And people feel very passionate about that in one way or another. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of middle gray area. Either you are supporting that or you are willing to do just about anything, call out the National Guard and build this giant wall and fence and electrify it and station armed guards there by it to shoot anyone who tries to come across. There's that philosophy and then there's the other one is that, you know, we have to, if they're, especially if they're children, we have to accept them, we have to care for them. It's the right thing to do and they're, and they're not taking jobs. Um, these immigrants, if you remove all of the people who are here illegally, our whole economy is going to fall apart because they're at the foundation of so many things that are cheap labor. Uh, the cost of everything would skyrocket if you actually got rid of those people. They serve um, a purpose here. So um, I want to look at the part of this, though, together that says the tragedy of the commons because that is an important one. Would someone like to start us off reading? Yeah. I will. Thank you. The fundamental error of spaceship ethics and the sharing it requires that leads to what I call the tragedy of the commons. Under a system of private property, the men who own the property recognize the responsibility to care for it, for if they don't, they will eventually suffer. A farmer, for instance, will allow no more cattle in a pasture than it is. It's carrying capacity justified. If he overloads it, their roads and sets in, weeds take over, and he loses the pasture. Pasture becomes a commons open to all the right of each to use it may not be matched by a corresponding responsibility to protect it. Asking everyone to use with it with discretion will hardly do, for the considerate herdsman who refers from overloading his common stuff is more than a selfish one. He says his needs are greater. If everyone would restrain himself, all would be well, but it takes only one less than everyone to bring the system of voluntary restraint. In a crowded world with less than perfect human beings, a mutual room is inevitable if there is no control. So this is the tragedy of the commons. One of the major tasks of education today would be the creation of such an acute awareness of the dangers of the commons that people will recognize its many varieties. For example, the air and water we have, we have become polluted because they were treated as commons. Further growth in the population per capita, conversion of natural resources to pollutants will only make the problem worse. The same holds true of the fish of the oceans. Fishing fleets have nearly disappeared in many parts of the world. Technological improvements in the art of fishing are hard, hastening the day of complete marine. Only the replacement of the system of commons with their responsible system of control to save land, air, water, and oceanic fisheries. Thank you. So the uh, basic premise uh, of this um, 
Commons idea is that people have to police themselves, act responsibly, act as stewards of their uh, environment, and um, do all of that. And he says that's not what we have seen throughout history, throughout antiquity. Time and time again, human beings have failed to exercise and demonstrate that kind of self-control. People have failed to be able to self-regulate. They do things to excess, they have little regard for others, they don't always think through consequences, they act irrationally, selfishly, in some way that would be uh, not as it should be. And he says it only takes a few people like that to ruin it for everyone else. It doesn't even have to be the majority. So with that in mind, and he gives the example of the fishing, how it's been replaced with more efficient means and it's put a lot of people out of work and how uh, our oceans are overfished at this point and it looks very um, possible and probable that uh, in the future, if we continue along this path, this trajectory, uh, there will be uh, no fish in the ocean to have, to fish. It will be gone, it will be depleted. There are some species that are already have been overfished to the point of being extinct. And um, so he uses that as an example of how people don't um, know how to put the brake on and stop themselves. They just see profit. They just, they're greedy. They just see what they want. They see an immediate gratification, an immediate need, and they act upon that without any forethought about what's going to happen later, what will be the consequences later. And that's hard for people to do. Um, so I think that that's a good point that he, he makes there. Now let's go to the end and let's take a look at what I'm asking you to do as we move over here. There's six questions on page uh, 333. Six questions and I think each person needs to answer these by yourself. It's just an accountability piece so that I can make sure you read this and really understand it. Don't copy questions. You don't even have to kind of craft any kind of, um, um, you know, well-written response. I just want the answer. This is just for me to check to make sure that you understand, you comprehend what you read, and that you get the main points that makes sense to you. This is your opportunity to do that with those six questions. Now, we're skipping number four uh, altogether. So go on over to page 335, and let's take a look at that. It says up here that on, on this part, we're going to look at the questions one, two, and three, and choose one of them, and then write, oh, a half a page to a page. It doesn't have to be much at all. I would say just a good, healthy paragraph. Let's look at this for a moment and talk about kind of how we do that. Number one, how can the good life be lived well? Explain your position first by defining the term and then presenting your own view within the context of the sources. Now this can be any of the uh, conversation pieces that we have read. The first, the second, or the third one. If you thumb back over here to the beginning um, of it, you will see the first conversational piece starts on uh, page 317. The happy life, the happy life, and he talks about what it is to have the good life. And then the singer's solution to world poverty, where he's saying we have to help, we, it's the only moral thing to do. And then the third selection where he's saying we can't help, we can't afford the price of doing that. So the first question kind of relates back to one of those other stories, and you would just write one little paragraph explaining what that means, uh, 